a short time ago an american airplane dropped one bomb on hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy that bomb has more power than twenty thousand tons of tnt <laughs> What we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. Yuck and cover. In the wake of disaster, you are about to enter upon probably the most difficult and yet most important period of your life. When to escape the effects of radioactive fallout for perhaps as long as the next two weeks, you will be deprived of all the conveniences of modern life when you will live under crowded conditions, almost elbow to elbow with your neighbor, when your diet, your personal hygiene, and other habits will undergo drastic change, until the passage of time has decayed radioactive substances and fallout to a point where it will be safe for you to take up your life where you left it. People of a certain age will recognize those sound bites. Those people were Cold War kids growing up between the end of World War II and the fall of the Soviet Union. This time on the Plutopia podcast, John and Scoop take a walk down that scary part of memory lane known as the Cold War. Oh, welcome everybody to another episode of the Plutopia News Network. And today, our guest is us, Scoop Sweeney and John Lebkowski. I don't trust those guys, do you? Well, I almost have to. Oh, okay. And um, I think that um, we have agreed to uh, wax nostalgic about the last Cold War. I'd rather wax my surfboard, but I don't have one. So I guess we should just wax nostalgic. Uh, the Cold you War. You can wax your mustache. Better. It, and it wasn't always cold. Uh, it was it, it was pretty heated at times back uh, during the so-called Cold War. So the Cold War era started apparently around 1947 when the Truman Doctrine uh, appeared and ran through 1991 when the Soviet Union dissolved like an Alka-Seltzer in a glass of water. And did it ever dissolve? That was an unexpected a outcome there. But of course, uh, instead of uh, yielding a new age of freedom and uh, democracy, it yielded a bunch of oligarchs who started taking over uh, a lot of, well, all of Russia, basically. And it's been kind of downhill from there. We probably didn't give them the support we should have for, for them to evolve a, a more democratic uh, form of governance. Uh, we sort of let the gangsters come in and take over. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, Putin, yeah. who came from the KGB. But that's kind of our way of operating uh, in the Western world is as soon as the emergency is over, you just uh, you know, forget them and move on to the, less, to, to the latest uh, shiny object that uh, has your attention. It's true. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in uh, geopolitical gaming, which is kind of what's been going on for probably throughout human existence. You know, there's constant like tribal wars happening and, and various alliances forming and treaties here and there. Um, we seem to be some pretty bad monkeys, really. <laughs> we can't seem to just kind of settle down and and live our life. You know, there's always something going on where somebody's trying to scheme to take power from others. And um, in in our particular lifetime, uh, well, you and I were growing up at a little in a little town in West Texas. Things were pretty placid. It was just after a major world war people had lost their taste for war democracy had taken hold in a bunch of places and um, in the u.s especially a commitment to democracy had become um, a way of life i mean we were taught 
in school that we were living in a democracy, that all men were created equal, and that um, we were in a melting pot. We were taught to be feel very positive about the, the idea that people came into the U.S. from many different places and sort of melted into this one, one country of citizens who, over the years, we came to believe could actually manifest their own cultures and still be part of the big mix. Well, lately, it hadn't really been much like that. And I keep, I, I find myself wondering whether, I, I assume they've eradicated that whole melting pot theory from the textbooks. Yeah, they're trying to anyway. Uh, you don't want to have anything that makes someone uncomfortable. Blah, blah, blah. Well, exactly. And you don't want to acknowledge that it was really okay and a positive thing for people to come into this country from other countries, especially people of color. So, so you know, we have a, a sort of different, different kind of thinking in, that has gained prominence. I don't think it's majority thinking by any stretch, but it certainly is more prominent than we ever thought it would be or could be. And um, that's all one part of the puzzle. But the other part of it is that we had this Cold War brewing, you know, the uh, in in our lifetime, in the first in our formative years, we were in a war that was not a kinetic war, but a war of uh, ideas and words, and uh, you know, um, various actions that were taken that were more symbolic, that weren't actually like people firing guns at each other. It was more like a like a, this great chess game between the Soviet Union on the one hand, uh, which was a communist uh, empire, uh, whatever communism might have been taken to mean. And, you know, the United States and the Western democracies were somewhat aligned with each other. And... Um, were dedicated to capitalism and free markets and that sort of thing. Well, the whole um, Cold War thing uh, was a surprise to some because during World War II, uh, the Soviet Union, that was part of the Allies. They were fighting the Nazis on the Eastern Front, and the Western world was over on the Western Front trying to uh, make Europe and uh, Eastern Europe free and safe for democracy. Of course, that uh, <laughs> didn't really happen. Everybody just sort of, wh whoever they invaded uh, became either uh, a, a democratic-ish uh, country or a member of the Soviet bloc. And that kind of solidified the whole Cold War posture is like East versus West. And then there was the Chinese uh, situation, which was another communist government that sort of got along with uh, the Russians and didn't get along at all with uh, the Western world. And that was, you know, a lot of people didn't remember, you know, people that don't study history don't remember that the uh, Russians, the Soviet Union, used to be part of the good guys. And then suddenly they became the bad guys. And then when uh, the Soviet Union fell apart, they became the good guys again for a while. And well, I mean, kind of. I mean, I think that my understanding was that the attitude toward the Soviets during World War II was that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But there was still the, a deep mistrust. And as soon as the war was over, uh, the concern about the Soviet empire grew. You know, and, and there was this concern that that it might be the next the next empire building regime to try to uh, take power over other countries. And that's why NATO formed to protect Western democracies from uh, incursions by the Soviet Union, which later 
you know, again, it, it kind of fell apart or it was, uh, I think they kind of starved it really kind of what they're trying to do now with sanctions. Well, concurrent with the uh, formation of like the you know, United Nations and all and NATO and all those fine organizations, another organization, uh, not so much an organization, but another movement really became active. And that was the ultra right wing, the Joe McCarthy, Roy Cohn uh, wing of the Republican Party who saw yeah. a communist in every part of government. And they were trying to root them all out, which is basically is we want to get them out so we can get our guys in. But the point for them was othering, really, the, to have an other that they could, uh, um, that they could, I mean, it's, it's just a, a kind of a trick, right? You, know, you get people to line up behind you by getting them opposed to some other set of people. And it doesn't matter whether they're, you call them communists or whether you call them liberals or whether you call them uh, pedophiles, well, whatever you want to call them, you know, you're basically saying to people, you guys are the good guys and those guys over there are the bad guys. Yeah. And that's what that was all about. And, and that's just a way to take power over people. Yeah. The way that they othered people uh, was pretty uh, nasty. They othered a lot of writers, a lot of people in Hollywood, if they were considered liberal, were suddenly uh, branded as communist, yeah, even though they had never <laughs> even been near a communist, just the fact that they had a, a liberal uh, utterance or a belief that uh, someone on uh, the McCarthy committees uh, decid decided was uh, a communist uh, sympathizer, then they could have a lot of people's careers and lives totally ruined just because of a suspicion, that, no, not, not even proof that they were a commie, just the suspicion was enough in those days to you know, have someone just totally tossed out and, you know, branded as a commie. Oh, that sounds a lot like cancel culture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I thought cancel culture was just something the left does. It's been. Are you saying that the right was doing that? You said they were doing it a long time ago. It's, it's not a new thing. It's the Swiss Army knife of culture there. You can be used by any old person. You know, it's a multi-purpose kind of thing. But well, one of the things I wanted to talk about, though, was kind of, I'm not an expert in geopolitics or in the Cold War or anything, but I am an expert in what it was like to be a kid growing up in the 50s and 60s in a world where um, the Cold War was happening. Uh, and where it was much discussed. And I can remember one of the, one of the funny things I was thinking about was how I used to really be in fear of, of Russia. And, and a lot of my fear was about this guy named Khrushchev that they kept talking about. And in my mind, he was like six and a half feet tall, this big lean, powerful guy who was like, kind of a Rasputin figure or whatever. And when I finally saw a picture of him and saw that he was like this little round guy, that kind of blew my mind. It was like, was like Shady Claus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is the guy I've been worried about. Yeah, and he was pounding his shoe on the tables whenever he, he was. Jack, that that was one of my favorite images of him at the, uh, I guess it was the United Nations when he disagreed with something. The Americans were saying he was pounding with his shoe. And it's like, wow, that's a, an interesting gesture. So Khrushchev was, um, he was kind of a an odd character, and I never completely understood him, but he was the guy who was, um, I guess what premier is it premier? Yeah, you know, yeah, and he he was the guy that saved Russia from the Stalinist basically. So he was yeah. a bit of a hero to the Communist Party because the Communist Party just wanted to be communist. They didn't want to be Stalinist because that was a a very evil period of time where they were doing a, a lot of the things that this guy named Putin <laughs> enjoys doing, you know, getting rid of anybody that, dis that disagrees with you. But he was driving the car. I mean, just for some background, uh, I mean, everybody knows this. The U.S. had a nuclear bomb. The Russians figured out how to build their own nuclear weapons. 
And then we were in the infamous arms race where each country was stacking up more and more nuclear bombs so that they could deter the other country uh, so that both countries would be afraid to really go to war, get into a hot war with each other because the the potential of that war was nuclear annihilation, not just of one or the other country, but of the whole world. Mm -hmm. So mutually assured destruction kind of held people at bay. And in the midst of all this, in, uh, let's see, I've got the date here, in October 16th through the 29th of 1962, we had what, what was called the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the U.S. had some missiles that were somewhere uh, in proximity to uh, the USSR, the Soviet Union. So the Soviets decided that they would put some missiles close to us in Cuba. Cuba, which had become a communist country after there had been a, uh, a revolution there, and they drove the capitalists out and had a communist revolution and, um, and they were allowing the Russians to put these missiles there. And the question was, what were we going to do about that? Well, what, what we did is uh, we got really frightened. I know I was in high school at the time, and people I knew were saying, well, I'm packing up all my rifles and food, and I'm going to go to the mountains. It's like, well, <laughs> good luck. I'd, I'd seen pictures of what the atomic bomb could do, so it's not going <laughs> to help you. you 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 may get uh radiation poisoning later than the rest of us but uh my uncle was in the air force and station he, he did his work at los alamos uh, in oh. in that period and i had to ask him when he visited with my mom one time you know it, it, is, is the atomic bomb really that scary and, and he showed me some pictures that he had in his briefcase of the trinity site where they set off the first atomic bombs and he said that was like a little pop gun and they showed a picture of some of the stuff from the bikini atoll where they had these yeah. big super you know the, uh, these were the hydrogen bombs which are really scary that's the stuff that you know can wipe out a whole city and that's i saw that and I like well that's scary you because know, i thought of the atomic bomb as just uh, like the bombs you saw in the cartoons you know dropping a uh, on the enemy, you know, little old bombs, but these were not little old bombs. They were scary. And what I remember is that Mrs. Brokaw, my science teacher in the eighth grade at the time, um, came into class and was talking about how her husband, who was in the Air Force and stationed at the air, local air base, was he and all the other pilots there were being scrambled uh, and they were all flying to Florida. And she was terrified. She was sure we were going to war, right? But Kennedy, John Kennedy, who was president at the time, had the same concern that Joe Biden has now, which is, how can I address this situation without triggering an actual hot war? And one of the ways they did that was by, they were stopping, they were going to stop missiles from coming into Cuba, but there was actually a semantic thing they did where they didn't call it a blockade. We, we often hear it referred to as a blockade, but they referred to it as a quarantine because the difference in description was apparently going to help stave off an actual war. But in fact, what they were doing is they weren't letting the Russians bring the missiles through to Cuba. And they had a big standoff down there. And the big question was whether we were going to escalate toward a hot war or whether somebody was going to back off somewhere and, and somebody did back off somewhere for quite a while there as to whether, you know, someone was going to blink. Unfortunately, the Russians blinked and turned around and they, you know, over the period of time dismantled or supposedly dismantled the, the uh, missile bases they already had established in Cuba. But uh, that was the scary part because it's, it was one thing when it was Russia way across over on the other side of the world with their rockets and missiles and bombs. And 
90 miles off of uh, Florida was a whole different scenario. It's like that's close, literally close to home and within uh, shooting distance of just about any part in the United States. And that fact itself was you know, panicked a lot of people. Including me. Yeah. Remember the uh, duck and cover drills? Now, that was yeah. a, a fun uh, uh, part of uh, the Cold War. In, in school, they'd have these drills, duck and cover, where you, you know, supposedly the bomb was about to be dropped. So you got down on the floor under your wooden desk and covered your head and uh, hoped for the best. Yeah, so that when your school was incinerated, you would be protected by your desk. The wooden desk, which you, the wooden desk. <laughs> they, they, they seemed to think it was like uh, you know um, some special magical thing that was going to you know all the rest of the buildings going to burn, but you'll be under that desk and you'll be okay. You'll be safe. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> I didn't believe that for a second. I had seen stuff burn. I knew what happened to wood when it got hot and it uh, did not bode well for anybody under the desk. You know, there's a great movie about this era called matinee. You, you remember that one? Matt, uh, I don't know if I remember matinee. Oh, man, I'm My favorite to... was On the Beach, which was a damn scary movie. And... Well, that was one that's, I mean, where there was actual, what was it? It was radiation was coming around and everybody was going to die Every, from everyone was radioactivity. Dying. So they were all just taking poison pills, doing their last whatever and taking poison pills. But Matinee is actually, it's a comedy. It was made in 93. And it was about, um, it was directed by Joe Dante. And uh, do you remember William Castle? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I used to have, I was in his fan club and we were supposed to recite every day. We we're supposed to say, William Castle is the master of movie horror. <laughs> That's pretty true. And he was actually the master of movie gimmicks. Like it, he did, made a movie called House on Haunted Hill where the skeleton kind of came out. It was like on a wire. They had a, a hanging skeleton on a wire that came across the theater at a strategic point during the movie or yeah, the we, tingler we got... where they wired vibrators into the seats and they would trigger the vibrators at a specific points in the movie. We got to see that in person. I, 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 I heard uh, yes. about it at first. I thought, they not going to do that. And they did it. And it's like, it, it, it was not really scary. It's kind of cheesy, you know, because I looked at it. It's like, well, no, it's not that scary, but it's an interesting uh, idea. You know, have this thing on a wire come out and scare the little kids. Yeah, we were we were fortunate enough to grow up in a town where uh, the movie theaters were owned by a family that loved movies, and they would if there was a gimmick for the movie, they would definitely deploy it. Oh, well, absolutely. But here's the thing: I, so the, this thing matinee is about a William Castle like character. John Goodman plays the part, uh, and this uh, this guy is about to he's launching a new movie, and uh, they're going to open in Key West, Florida, which of course is you know right across the water from Cuba, and um, uh, this this movie that he's opening is one of his gimmicky horror movies, and it's opening uh, at the same time that. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis is going on. So the movie is really kind of about the Cuban Missile Crisis and how people were reacting to it as much as anything. And then there was the movie where the famous line, there'll be no fighting in the war room, was uh, <laughs> delivered, something to that effect. Dr. Strangelove, Stanley yep. Kubrick's masterpiece uh, that pretty much captured the whole thing behind all the uh, right-wing conspiracies about just about everything and uh, the ultimate uh, fate of people who really you know, follow through on those conspiracy theories. The guys said that uh, his vital uh, precious bodily fluids, precious right, precious bodily fluids had been compromised by fluoride in the water. That was Sterling Hayden as General Jack D. Ripper. Yep, yep. <laughs> 
but that that was just a, a mar <laughs> an insanely funny but also insanely Very right real. on target for what you know was going on during the cold war the kind of people that were in charge supposedly or trying to be in charge and uh, the whole concept of uh, mutually uh, what was mutually assured destruction yeah right and that meant that yeah they don't dare shoot their rockets because we'll shoot all of ours and we'll all die but uh, the doomsday machine there are plenty of people who were crazy enough to say no nah, i'll just duck under a rock <laughs> and i'll be okay or whatever but uh, a very great movie, and you know the great image of uh, Slim Pickens riding on a missile or on a bomb, an atomic bomb, as it's being dropped, waving his cowboy hat in, in true Slim Pickens style, and yeehaw off into the uh, <laughs> mushroom cloud. And of course, triggering the uh, the nuclear holocaust um, at, at the very end. <laughs> Dr. Strangelove rises up and says, Mein Fuhrer, I can walk. You know, <laughs> he's been in a wheelchair the whole time. And then they cut to all these nuclear explosions that are happening. And the song that plays is We'll Meet Again. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's a great version of that by the birds that I love. Uh, on, uh, I think it was their, their second album. Uh, they did a version of We'll Meet Again. It, it, just a great song for the apocalypse. And then there was failsafe. Do you remember failsafe? Yeah, that was that was more on target, you know, serious. <laughs> yeah, it was. There was no tongue in cheek there. They were showing what could actually happen, and uh, the the gimmick or the the way failsafe went was that um, uh, I think it was that we were accidentally blowing up maybe Moscow or one of the cities in Russia. And that ultimately we had to agree to blow up one of our own cities. Yeah. New York city, <laughs> New York city, um, which at the time, you know, probably. Yeah. A lot of people in the South said, well, I'm all for that. Go ahead. Yeah. It was a, it wasn't the same New York city. <laughs> but what would that have done the West Side Story, man? That would have been all messed up. Yeah, yeah, there'd be a little dancing. Um, but, you know, the whole concept behind uh, the military strategies that were in place in the Cold War were somewhere uh, realistic. You know, the, uh, the the mutually assured destruction was a, you know, a, a real thing because there were enough warheads on either side that there is no way anyone would survive if if, if someone shot off the big if, if we dropped the big one someone would drop a bigger one on us and then it just goes out of control and you know the cockroaches end up <laughs> taking and it hadn't changed but we haven't worried about it for a while because russia had sort of backed off they had like the the ussr had dissolved and so forth but you know what i think is happening now is actually a good thing because I really think that that maybe it's good for people to wake up every day with anxiety that the world's going to blow up. Mm -hmm. Maybe they would take their life a little more seriously and try to do something to stop it from happening. I mean, climate change is a slow burn, but the nuclear holocaust happens really fast. Yeah, climate change is really dropping the big one. That's the big one that uh, it can definitely wipe out humanity and a lot of people don't even believe that it exists well i think more and more people believe that it exists and um they still have an odd relationship to the facts about it though it's like nobody really seems to to, to be feeling any sense of urgency about it even those people who understand that it really is urgent they don't have the right sense of urgency about it. It's just hard to, because it's not on your doorstep, you know, it's not right outside. It's not something that's happening right now. You might get, you know, every now and then we have, uh, and this is happening increasingly. We have these anomalous climate events that, uh, climate events that are potentially climate driven events, uh, weather events. 
and they're just weird. You know, weird things are starting to happen. And we can see that Antarctica is warming and so forth. Um, We're in the middle we can of see the enough now. Yeah, I mean, we can see enough now to see that this is really, there's a serious thing happening here. And, and, and we have one catast- catastrophe after another. Um, but it's still not enough to feel like it's really happening now and it's really urgent. And in fact, it'll be a while before it really reaches the level that the earth is starting to feel unlivable. And by then it'll be way too late to do anything about it. Yeah. People are waiting for that uh, to happen so that they, then they can fix things because most people will find that uh, doing the right thing in terms of preventing climate change, it's, it's inconvenient. That means they'd have to give up their gas guzzling car. They'd have to, uh, give up eating so much meat because of all that cow, all the cow farts out there (laughs) that are, that's actually a real thing folks. And uh, it's contributing to all the methane that's going into the atmosphere. People don't want to do the inconvenient thing. It's easier just to have that cheeseburger and jump into the old 57 Chevy and drive until the gasoline runs out. Well, in fact, what we would have to do in order to, affect enough change to really effectively deal with climate change, especially this late in the game, it would be a a radical shift in the way that we live, you know, just a radical shift. And it's really hard for us to extricate ourselves from a dependence on fossil fuels, because that's kind of insinuated into everything. I mean, all sorts of things that we have or that we consume or that we depend on actually depend on fossil fuels for their ongoing sustenance and production. So what are we going to do? How are we going to build a sustainable world? Um, Well, maybe we're not. Maybe either we're going to do this nuclear thing and just end it all now and get rid of the monkeys, or maybe the monkeys are going to burn themselves out with climate change. The world will still be here. The monkeys oh, yeah. will be gone. The world comes, you know, stays well, pretty much where it's at. And uh, it, it's a, we're, we're just a minor inconvenience that it has infected it for a few you know, million years. But uh, the theory is that either the cockroaches will take over or, uh, you know, some some other life form will uh, develop a brain and then they'll start destroying the, <laughs> the environment. You know, we're at the middle of the, the great, uh, dip, not depression, the great drought here in the western United States. We see it just over to the west of us in the hill country where it's gotten to be extreme drought. And this is not just something that's going to go away eventually because the forecast we see say that this is a long-term result of, of uh, climate change. In yeah. California, I mean, they're going to run out of water. There's no way around it. They've already run dry in a lot of their reservoirs, and it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon. And that's the sort of thing we're going to be having to deal with, either deal with or or not deal with and suffer the consequences. Yeah, there's, there's the map. And, it, and, you know, sitting here in Austin, Texas right now, Let's see, I guess we're down in like a severe drought area, if not extreme, yeah. but we don't really notice it. We don't yeah, think Parts of, of Austin and drought. my part of Bastrop County is in kind of the, uh, the yellow abnormally dry, but uh, just to the west in the hill country, it's just nasty out there. I mean, nothing is growing. Yeah. Because you should right, be able to drive through there with and see green grass, but <laughs> we're depressing the shit out of everybody. What can we say that's positive about all this? Positive, huh? Well, we're still around. We're doing our positive thing to tell people about the parts of life that are uh, worth living. Things like music and art and culture and progressive politics. Anyway, I think we're both optimists. I'm sort of starting to see it all as just a kind of really terrible circus. And Not so a much very of, entertaining one either. Well, so much of what is actually reported about politics is just performative. You know, basically, 
various politicians acting out to try to make their points. And the latest thing is um, our governor, Greg Abbott here in Texas, uh, choosing to stop every truck that's coming into the state uh, at the border. Yeah, that was a smooth move. And people are sort of wringing their hands saying, uh, saying that, you know, this is just a complete overreaction. It's redundant. Uh, the checks are already happening. And it's like, don't you realize that you're breaking the supply chain? Of course he realizes he's breaking the supply chain. And who do we blame when we break the supply chain? We don't blame Greg Abbott. We blame Joe Biden. We blame the president. Yeah, that's that's the uh, right out of the Trump uh, family playbook there. That was their favorite thing of uh, doing something that's going to demonize the others. And then you come in and say, but if you elect me, it'll all be better. And that's what uh, Abbott is doing. He <clears throat> says, no, it, it wasn't a mistake. I'm keeping all that fentanyl from coming across and all those illegal aliens. <clears throat> But He's not even being sneaky about it. Ken Paxton was on Fox News saying that the governor has figured out we can stop trade along the border, slow it down, and it will create pressure to achieve Republican political goals. Exactly. <laughs> Those are the talking points that they all are going by. And uh, sometimes it works. But I noticed, you know, he, he, Abbott had to back off a little bit because you know, there were a lot of conservatives that were saying, boy, this is stupid. I mean, <laughs> we're shooting ourselves in the foot to get votes. And uh, it's the long-term damage is going to be pretty severe when you impact, you know, the foodstuffs coming across the border. That's where a lot of our groceries in Texas come from. And if uh, Bubba can't get his uh, avocados for his guacamole, uh, at the, during happy hour, he's going to be pissed off. Indeed. Indeed. I don't know what to make of all of it. I, I think that politics was always like terrible, hmm. horrible the way that, I mean, we think that today it's worse than it's ever been, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's a little more, a little higher volume than it's been in the past. Maybe we're more aware of what people are thinking, the rank and file are thinking than we were before because we can see it on social media. But I think these terrible political games have, have been, you know, the state of things for as long as I've been around. Yeah. And when I think back and think about what the politics was like and were like in, um, uh, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s i think it's, there's just always been this sort of terrible terribly bad theater going on and uh and we get increasingly obsessed with it people are so obsessed with it now that they're identifying like they're not just kind of going through their life and living their life and hanging out with their neighbors and so forth we're kind of thinking about well, well, is that neighbor of mine? Is he a, is he a Democrat or a Republican? Is he a good guy or a bad guy? You know. Yeah. Well, politics uh, have have always been that way. It's the changes in the way we get our information that has uh, sort of amped up the uh, temperature in, in in politics. It, it's not so much that it's that different. It's just so much easier to get that information out. And so these people are using social media and uh, news outlets, your know, cable news especially, to you know spread whatever it is that they're spreading, manure or good politics, whatever. And it's, it seems like politics is not really a, a matter of getting the best and the brightest in charge. Uh, generally, that's not the people <laughs> that that end up leading you know, the the political parties. It's got, it's the person that has the biggest uh, bank uh, bank account or the uh, the heavy duty uh, backers or the lobbyists that are going to get them over. You know, it's not the best and the brightest. It's just the connected folk that uh, 
get to take over the wheel of government. Yeah, I mean, when has it ever been the best and the brightest? If you look at the list of like recent presidents, really, they've all sort of let us down one way or another. They've all like pulled shit that was, you know, counterproductive and uh, it was damaging to one set of people or another. Uh, we had um, we had these sort of lofty notions of like what John F. Kennedy represented when when he was president. We could have those lofty notions pro partly because he didn't last too long as president before he had been assassinated. So he became kind of a martyr and and people had this sense that he had been really special and as a president and, and that there were there was a sense of wonder around his presidency. But really, it's, it's not clear that he was doing any better than anybody ever had. Yeah, he was a political animal. He came from a family of political animals. And that, that was well, the I mean, business. Gangsters, too. You know, yeah. Warm, Irish mob. Womanizers. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's and, you know, LBJ, no you can look at LBJ's flaws or Nixon's flaws, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter. I mean, it's one after another. They all screwed a bunch of stuff up. None of and it was always a mess. Yeah, none of these people get up. Will be up on Mount Rushmore. <laughs> it's and despite all that, we just kind of go about our business and live our life. And if we can just kind of keep keep spinning around, you know, if we can just kind of keep the the cash flowing, keep the water on, keep the electricity on. Unfortunately, Abbott has a little trouble with that. But <laughs> uh, if we can just kind of like sustain ourselves and 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 get by from day to day then we're doing pretty good uh if to the extent that people focus on politics and i i'm very guilty of this myself you know i got really really focused on politics especially during the trump years oh my god well you couldn't avoid it really <laughs> well but it's like it really wasn't affecting me very much and it wasn't affecting most people very much you know, the kinds of things that we were tearing our hair out about, it wasn't necessarily something that was like in our backyard that was really a problem for us. It was just that the optics were really bad and you were being hit with it constantly through television news. And, you know, if, when it was Trump, everybody on the left or everybody that was uh, like aligned with the Democratic Party really up in arms how terrible this guy is you know what a what a complete asshole he is i mean he's obviously sociopathic and and a bully and a terrible person but the it's questionable how much that was really affecting people you know well, and well, and then biden comes in and the the guys on the right start freaking out about it and they're talking about how he's a bumbler and they make fun of his speech impediment, which I think is, you know, kind of a common thing on the right is to bully people and make fun of them. And they, you know, they tear him down constantly and they try to make him look as bad as possible. And, uh, you know, he's doing some good things and some of those things are maybe affecting us somewhat, but we're not being that affected by him either, you know? Well, you know, politics is like uh, Dragnet was uh, kind of a to paraphrase to paraphrase Joe Friday and his introduction of Dragnet. You know, the names have been changed to protect the guilty in this case, <laughs> and that's all it is. I mean, the evil, uh, the evil one, you know, gets a new name every uh, every election. I Trump thought you were going to say one. now Biden's the evil one, and you know. Sarah Palin will be the next evil. Who knows? I thought you were going to say just the facts, ma'am. Just the <laughs> facts. And I was thinking, whose facts? Facts are, are out of My style. facts are your facts. Yeah, you know, it's, it's not stylish to tell the truth anymore, you know. Fact, right, we all have alternate facts. Facts are for suckers, according to uh, <laughs> some folks out there. I'm waiting for you to say something. I'm waiting for you. Ah, oh, no. We have a standoff there. <laughs> <laughs>
I was being distracted by the flashing light on my recorder here. <laughs> I was being distracted by the flashing light in the middle of my brain. That's okay. But, you know, the whole thing of uh, the impact news, whether it's good or bad, the, the, the impact upon people is uh, sometimes good, but a lot of times lately it's been really bad. I, my wife, Clarissa, you know, she's... Uh, re recovering from a surgery, and so she's been uh, pretty much a bed bedridden for a while, and had uh, nothing but TV to watch. And uh, she had to finally say the other day that she could not watch the news anymore because it was one thing to see crazy politicians, you know, being crazy with each other, but you know, seeing you know women and children being murdered, you know, by uh, crazy people with guns and bombs, it, that was just too much. And she's on a diet right now of uh, no news for a while. And I, I have to agree with her. It, it is, uh, it, it affects your soul when you see this sort of thing. And you know that there are people out there, supposed human beings who are doing these things and who knows why. Yeah, I, I don't get it. Well, we've been at it for about 45 minutes, and now we're starting to have pauses. Should we start heading out toward the uh, exit, or do you have some uh, final observations on being a Cold War kid? We're, we're no longer, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty childish, but I'm not a kid. Well... I'm I'm thinking about the place where it really does matter, you know, the politics or whatever. I'm thinking about um, the people in Ukraine and how they're being affected by um, politics in the sense of a real power grab, you know, a really terrible power grab. And you could see this coming when they took over Crimea. And everyone said, well, you got to do something. But of course, we didn't. And here we go again. Well, I mean, you got different people in, in power now than you did then. Uh, so who knows? Maybe we would have done something then if we'd had, you know, if it had been Biden instead of Trump or whatever. Or let's see, was Trump the president when they hit Crimea or? See, was uh, that even before that? It was 2014, wasn't it? Uh, that would have been Obama. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, he, you know, <laughs> he had a, a lot of weaknesses as well. You know, there was a, a lot of uh, balls dropped by the Obama uh, administration. You know, they, they were not perfect. Well, obviously, and, and none, no administration is. But I really think, I mean, the thing that we should thing that we should take seriously right now is not like kind of what our little issues are here in the United States. There, there's a lot of bad shit going on, but there always has been some bad shit going on, but we're not getting bombed into the stone age and the Ukrainians are. So if there's a, a place where politics really matters, it's there. And it's in this thing with Russia and with Putin and Putin, who, you know, I had no idea that he, and I, I guess I was naive, I had no idea that he would be so ruthless, and that he would, I couldn't imagine anybody doing what they're doing right now, and, and you know, it is fairly unprecedented, and uh, clearly, you know, they're, they're, there's a clear case that war crimes are being committed, and who knows where that's going to go, but... <laughs> That's, you know, that's where I think it, the politics matters. Yeah, we should and, have known with the KGB background of Putin that uh, he was not going to be a, a good guy. We were hoping he would be in a, in a deranged uh, megalomaniac, but uh, that seems to be the direction in which he's headed. And in the screwed up politics of our country, the same people who were saying that Putin really was a good guy months ago are now saying why aren't we doing more to help ukraine yeah. why aren't we attacking the russians 
They said he was a genius back then. Now all of a sudden, it's it's by it's Biden's fault. Oh. So it's all very frustrating. And yeah. sometimes I think that I would like to just put politics in a lockbox and put it away somewhere. But you know, you can't. Yeah, you can't. Because your life it. is always affected by it. Yeah. But you can make sure that your life includes the things that are good for your soul, art, music, uh, family. Those are some things that... Uh, community. Yeah, having a good community, have good people around you. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good cure-all for uh, a lot of things. But, you know, you can't just uh, put your head in the sand and do the ostrich thing and say, oh, I don't see anything. There's nothing going on over there. Yeah, there is, and you have to do something about that, but you can't let your uh, your psyche be uh, just taken over by that because <laughs> that's not healthy either. Yeah, so I think that what we should be about, what our principles should be and what we should stand for is, you know, uh, psyche optimization and cleaning. We should help people get their heads straight as well as we can. And one way to do that is with art, with humor, and with some level of grace. Yeah, so Plutopia is going to be kind of the Stanley steamer of your psyche. Yeah, we should start our own community. <laughs> build a community we already platform. have. Yeah. Well, we, we have, but <laughs> I think the next step would be to, to implement something like Discord, a Discord server and invite people to it. So maybe we'll do that in the near future. Come on down, folks. Uh, we promise not to uh, do anything evil, or at least too evil. Yeah, we, we stay within our lane. Yeah. Stay within uh, bounds. Yeah, now on a weekend, I have trouble staying in my lane or any lane at all there, but that's, that's generally because of... Uh, you know, be going, taking a detour through the wine cellar, but uh, that's a whole other I story. Staying awake. <laughs> so what do you well, say, John? Shall we? Shall we end this? Well, let's don't end it. We'll just uh, say to be continued. To be continued. Yeah, you know, Scoop and I are starting to like having these uh, little chats here, where we're just recording the two of us. Uh, without a guest and uh, give us some feedback if you if you like this conversation obviously there's a lot we don't know and and the one thing that we do know is how we feel we're, we're open to criticism even uh, as long as you're not criticizing my taste in clothing or music uh, I'll probably go along with you right on well thank you John this has been a lot of fun and We'll be doing it again uh, real soon, I'm sure. Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. And uh, time to say over and out. Over and out. Thanks, folks. See you next time. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.